Newton's law of universal gravitation has taught us that two particles with mass m1 and m2 have an attraction to each other. Particle 1 feels a force attracting it towards particle 2, and particle 2 experiences a force attracting it towards particle 1. It's an action-reaction pair. Here's the force on 1 from 2, and here's the force on 2 from 1. They are equal and opposite forces, and their magnitude is calculated with Newton's law of universal gravitation given here. But let's say we introduce a third particle. Yes, it is true that particle 1 will be attracted towards particle 3, particle 3 will be attracted towards particle 1, but particle 3 will also be attracted towards particle 2, as well as particle 2 being attracted towards particle 3. So here we have to make sure we understand that we, when we talk about a force on an object, a net force, we have to specify which object it is. So if I want to know what is the force, the gravitational force acting on number one because of two and three, then I have to add these vectors. And that is called the principle of superposition. So no matter how many particles you would have, if we are trying to figure out the force on one of the particles, so for example, particle number one, we add up all the forces on particle one. The force on one from two, the force on one from three, and the fourth and the fifth and however many n particles there are and we add them all up vectorally. Let's demonstrate this with checkpoint number two on page 333 of the textbook. So in each example we have three masses of equal mass and we're trying to find the net force on the particle labeled m from the other two forces. So we're going to draw force diagrams, and then we're going to add the vectors vectorally. Rank the arrangements according to the magnitude of the net gravitational force on the particle labeled M, greatest first. And in arrangement two is the direction of the net force closer to the line of length little d or closer to the line of length big D. So I've redrawn these large so that we can draw some force diagrams on them. So let's start off with the first one. Mass M is being attracted to the right from this particle and this particle. We know that Newton's law of universal gravitation follows what's called the inverse square law. So you can see here little d is a certain distance and big D is twice that distance. So if I replace r with a distance that's now twice r, don't forget to put the, the total distance to r in parentheses. So when we square that, we get g m1 m2 over 4 r squared. And if I rewrite that 4 over here, now it makes it obvious that my new force, when the distance is 2r, if I call this the old, old force at distance r, then my new force at distance 2r is one-fourth the same amount that I had of, as the old force. And if I were to triple the distance, now this would be a 3r, this would become one-ninth. So we call this the inverse square law. Whatever factor the distance increases by, you square it and then take the reciprocal of it and multiply the old force times that reciprocal value, and that is your new force. So you can see here, the force from D is just this short vector right here, and from capital D, because uh, it's way over here. And if we call this particle little d, the force on this one is greater. You can see all the way to here is the magnitude of that force from this particle, and this vector is one-fourth as long as this one. And when I add them together, I get this vector. So my net force is to the right with this relative magnitude. Number two, we've got the particles here and here. Now it makes a right angle. And so you see part this particle at capital D away 
is a much smaller force. In fact, it's one-fourth the magnitude of the force from uh, d. Here's my force from little d, so from little d. And of course, when vectors are at right angles, to add them vectorially, I use the uh, parallelogram rule. So there is my net force right there. Number three, now m is in the middle. Little d is over here, and big D is over there. So my little d has this magnitude of force. My big D has this magnitude of force, but they point in opposite directions. So this vector is subtracted from this vector to give me a net force that is less than F sub little d. And there it is right there. There's my net force from net gravitational force from those two particles. And then my last one is really the second one just rotated uh, at a different uh, in a different direction. So it comes out to be the same magnitude. So if I have to rank these, this one is going to be the greatest. Then these two will tie. These two will tie for being in second place. And this one will be in last place for the lowest magnitude or the smallest magnitude of net force. Then it asks, is the direction in arrangement 2, right here, in arrangement 2, is the direction of the net force closer to the line of length d or to little d or to the line of big D? And so here's the line of little d, and it is closer to that one than big D. And of course, that's because big D is much further away, so its contribution to the net force is much less. Little d is much closer, so its contribution is bigger. So when you add those two vectors, the net force is closer to the larger force. Now let's show you an example where we take our sigma notation and extend it to the integral. That the net, the force, the overall gravitational force, is the sum of all the incremental contributions of force. And I'm not going to go through the whole proof with you, but we're going to use a proof of Newton's shell theorem. Okay? So Newton's shell theorem, remember it says that the gravitational attraction on this mass out here, because of this shell of mass, is the same as if all this mass was located at its center. So basically what we do is we break the shell up into many, many rings. If you want a copy of this, I'm happy to share it with you. And then we sum up all the forces from each ring. And here's all the work, and it gets down to this equation right here. And in the previous step before that, this is the radius of the shell, and you see it cancels out of the equation. And the only thing that matters is the little mass outside the shell, the mass of the shell, the gravitational constant, and the distance between their centers. Okay? So that is... If you'd like a copy of this, let me know, and I'll get a copy to, to you. But it is not something we're going to uh, ask you to derive yourself, Newton's Shell Theorem.